Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Welcome to church. We are in John chapter 8. If you've uh, found it already, we'll look at the first 12 verses. And then we will pause next week for Palm Sunday and uh, Easter the week after. And then we'll come back to John chapter 8 in a couple of weeks. But this is a great passage to uh, pause and reflect on after we teach it. Uh, 12 short verses, but powerful verses. You remember, Jesus is still speaking in the temple. And uh, he has been challenged by the Jewish leaders. He is already uh, threatened uh, by those who despise him to take his life. And yet he is boldly speaking in which will be one of his last major public appearances at the temple before the next feast of the following season, which will be Passover and he'll be crucified. So there's an urgency as we talked about last week, there's an intensity building up as Jesus is speaking. And as they hate him and as they seek to trick him and uh, try and take his life, uh, they have a different view than you and I have of this Jesus. Let, let me show you, we're, we're seeing the persecuted Jesus and the enemies of Jesus in this passage. But before we even go there, look here with me or just listen to a couple of these verses uh, that this is that Jesus that we know. Here's what James 5, 9 says. Do not complain, brethren, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You know who that is? Jesus. This Jesus. Acts 10, verse 42. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Jesus. That's Jesus. This is the Jesus that they are hearing teach and watching heal and they are out to kill. Here's what else the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all be uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Everybody will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This Jesus. And they are mocking him. Acts continues on. Matthew continues on with declaring that Jesus himself is the judge of the world. And with that in mind, as you're watching Jesus be ridiculed and, and uh, attacked by his enemies, with that in mind, remember who he is. And now watch how he responds. The Jesus who will judge the world is teaching in the temple. And he will encounter a situation where a woman is thrust before him right in the middle of the temple, right in the middle of his teaching by his enemies to embarrass her, but mostly to test and embarrass him. In 1912, the uh, famous song that we know and love to sing was written by Austin Miles. And he, his granddaughter says he wrote it with the idea after reading John chapter 20, which is Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene after he rises from the tomb. He was so moved by that encounter and the tenderness of Jesus in the garden that he wrote these words. And we're going to sing them together in just a moment. But they would also apply, and I, that's why I want you to see it first and to sing it first. They would also apply to this woman that we're about to meet. Tender words from a tender master. And you know it, sing it with me. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Discloses, and he walks 
with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Listen to the intimacy of this second verse. For some reason, we typically only sing it at funerals. But listen and see if you can take your place to that time when Jesus interrupted your sin, when Jesus forgave you and took you out of a shameful situation. <coughs> second verse says, he speaks, this master, this judge, this God-man. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing. That's the judge. That's the God man. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And the response then from Austin Miles would be the same response of Mary Magdalene and same response of this woman we're about to meet and the same response of many in this room who have encountered Jesus after uh, a, a recognition of their sin. Sing it with me. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is called. sing a testimony of your own salvation the joy that my heavenly father through jesus christ and i share is like nothing that can compare he rescued me from the pit of hell he rescued you from your sin from when you stray and he even took the shame away with that boldness of your testimony with what you know about the true jesus not what others say not what the world thinks or doesn't think but with what you know of your own testimony, come into the temple with me. Jesus will be sitting as he teaches. The crowd will be standing. And here is the account from verse 1. It was early in the morning. He came again into the temple as he had done last week's study. And all the people came to him. The popularity had grown. They knew the controversy. They knew the healings but they were awestruck with the teaching. So now they're coming early in the morning to hear him teach. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. So unlike you sitting now while I'm standing, it was just the opposite. The people in the temple would stand and the rabbi would sit. And that was the custom, that was what they were used to. And in that position, he is teaching with the same authority from what you read out of these words, with the uh, expression and authority that struck the temple guards. Do you remember last week? So they had to respond to those who wanted him arrested, saying, we've never heard a man like this talk before. He has an authority that we, we can't get. That's the setting. That's the intensity. That's the kingdom of God present on earth. And he begins teaching them. Verse 3 tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll hear me often refer to them as the Jewish leaders. Sometimes they're just called the Jews. But here they are, the scribes and the Pharisees who were set to make him die. They enter in and it says to us, they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. 
You know the story. And you know some of the background of what Jesus has already addressed. But understand, first of all, who it is and when they do it. These are loathing people to kill Jesus. And now in order, we'll see it later in the text, in order to catch him or test him, they're setting him up. They think if we can just set him up in this trap, we'll get him. How he responds to this situation may take care of all of our problems. And notice that they didn't do it after the teaching. They didn't say, hey, Rabbi, we have a situation of sin here. Can you advise? But they both want to publicly humiliate the woman and they want to publicly humiliate and catch Jesus in his teaching. So there it is, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Now, you think like I think when you study this passage, adultery takes two people. They bring one. They bring the woman. The man is never mentioned. And it is a lot of speculation in this passage, but beyond that speculation, it is the woman caught, and we will find in a moment that she's caught in the very act of adultery. So this uh, woman has been dragged into the temple in front of this rabbi, teacher, God man, and they propose, that you're about to read with me, they propose that he solved the situation. And here's how they do it. And as he's teaching the Pharisees, Sadducees and Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, rabbi, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Which if you look at the situation again in the setting, they bring her from the very act and put her in the midst of the crowd, in the midst of Jesus, probably uh, part of the crowd. Remember, they're standing and Jesus is sitting. And as he's teaching, he looks up and he sees the crowd separate. And this woman with her head, no doubt, bowed in shame. Perhaps her hair hanging to cover her face is dragged and thrown before Jesus as he teaches. And you saw their questioning, their statement, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, the very act. That means that they were watching more, what's well, clearly a setup and more than likely set it up so that they could catch her with this in mind. And here is their statement with the situation. Every eye is on this woman and every eye is on Jesus and here's what the Jewish leaders say now Moses here's the situation she's got in the act of adultery now Moses in the law commanded get that word we are followers of Moses we are followers of the law and he commanded no option he commanded us that such meaning a woman a person caught in adultery, such a person should be stoned. That was their execution. But remember where they are. They're in the temple in Jerusalem. They, there is a Roman law that supersedes their law. Keep this in mind. And so however Jesus responds to this, they're prepared to nail him either way, literally in a few weeks. They'll nail him to a cross. But their attempt now is to catch him in some theological, uh, not so much a debate, but dilemma, and to see how he will respond. Moses tells us that this person should be stoned. But you, Rabbi, God, man, what do you say? Do you have a different position than Moses? That's a good one, isn't it? From the Jewish leader's perspective. But what do you say about this situation? Moses tells us to kill her. What do you say? And they said this, here's your answer, not really a spoiler alert, it's right in the middle of the passage. They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. They haven't been able to get him. They tried it when he healed the paralytic man of 38 years. 
on the Sabbath and he shut them down. They've tried it at different angles and different avenues, but now they're trying to do this to test him in order that they might have a basis of something which they can accuse him. I'm somewhat of a student of uh, the reactions of Jesus, the response of Jesus, especially in high tense situations. This would be one of them, wouldn't it be? How he responds not just with the words or lack of, but how he responds under pressure. I would love, it's a, it's a life goal of mine to emulate that, to, to respond like Jesus does. Here's his response in the nonverbal. It says, after the presentation of the challenge, they wanted something to accuse him with. It says, but Jesus. This is like a but God moment, isn't it? The tense environment is there. The gotcha question is out. Moses says this, what you gonna say, Jesus? And Jesus, but Jesus, responded this way. It says he stooped down. He's already sitting and he stooped down, it says, and he started writing on the ground with his finger. And listen to this beautiful addition that John gives us, as though he did not hear. Your question, your trick, your setup does not phase me. In other words, Jesus ignored them and he went to the, from the sitting position, he went to the stooping position. And you'll find out as he stoops, he's right in front of this woman. In other words, he goes from a humble position of teaching in a chair to a stooping position in front of this woman. And he begins to write on the ground. J just for a visual, again, you're sitting watching me standing. But the point of view from the audience would have been from what you're seeing now, as I teach you, to this. He's out of view. He's quiet. The woman, no doubt weeping, is right before him as he stoops and begins to write in the ground. So one moment they're looking at Jesus teaching and the next moment after this great interruption, he's down on the ground before a sinful woman stooping, becoming, in other words, to the low place that she's at in her humility in her sin, he comes down and identifies with her, even though all the accusers have stated their case. My friends, that's exactly what your Jesus does to you. In your lowest time, in your most shameful time, he comes down to your level. He comes down to the whole earth's level if they'll receive him. But for us who are believers, and I'm teaching this to believers, he comes down to your level and says, I'm here with you and I don't even need to say a word. Plenty of speculation on what he was writing. The word's interesting, it says he wrote, he could have just been doodling. Almost like, whatever. Or you've heard the speculations, he could have been writing all their names down and times and places where they've committed adultery speculation we don't know but he is at her level not their level and as he stoops and as he writes could you imagine the absence of sound in that room it must have been stunning as though he did not hear but they're persistent look at verse 7 so when they continued asking him, not going to let this go. I mean, we worked hard to set this up and we caught her 
And now we are going to continue to ask the question, especially after they see his response. It's at that point that Jesus raised himself up, perhaps back to the chair. I don't know how long that took. Was he speaking to the woman at this point? Perhaps hugging her? Maybe he actually wrote in the ground, John 3, 16. For God so loved you that he sent me that who knows, speculation. But now he's back up, perhaps in the chair. He raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. When he finally becomes verbal after the teaching time and this situation interrupts all of that, he comes to her level, ministering to her by his very presence, ignoring the accusers. And when they continue to accuse and continue to press for an answer, he raises up with this wonderful statement, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Let me tell you what that statement is not. Finding the perfect person in the room that day, there was only one and he's stooping on the ground. So when he says he who is without sin, it actually infers to the legal process here, and I'll make it brief, but in order to follow Moses' instruction to stone her, there first must be two witnesses of the action. So legally, two witnesses must be to the forefront to give testimony of her adultery. And from those two witnesses, the testimony had to be exactly 100% the same. Couldn't vary. Two witnesses. Testimony had to be the same. And they actually had to see, we won't be too graphic here, but follow me with a filter. Uh, they had to see the act. Couldn't be say, well, they were in that room or they were here and we heard. They had to see the physical act, these two witnesses. And then when execution was called for by stoning, the person, one of those two witnesses, would have to be the first one to pick up a stone. It wasn't just anybody. So you absolutely saw this. You have a verifying witness. You saw the act. The testimony is true. Now you, by your own testimony and the proof there, you are the one to pick up the stone. Anyone in that room capable to do that? Anyone able to cast that judgment, Jesus says, with that statement? He doesn't get into the law of Moses. He doesn't get into their legalistic trips. He doesn't get into all of the testing. He just simply says, he who is without sin among you, you specifically who saw this, you come forward and throw a stone at her first. And then I love that physical demonstration. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground whatever he was writing. You don't want to interrupt Jesus when he's writing. You don't want to interrupt him when he's forgiving. You don't want to interrupt him when he's communicating to someone broken and shameful the healing that only God brings. So much of that opportunity is missed in our world. People are shamed daily on social media. They're shamed as Satan seduces them into sin and then steps on their neck and says, there's not a God that will forgive you. This is why we proclaim this message. This same Jesus, the judge of the world, is the one that stoops down to the lowliest of person, the most shame-filled person, and says, I'm here, and even the accusers won't interrupt what I'm going to do for you. So once again, he is stooping now and he wrote on the ground, verse nine, then those who heard it, heard that statement, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Those who heard it 
being convicted by their conscience. Oh, how pregnant is that? Convicted by the reality of God's truth and authority spoken by the God man himself of their own sin and what they were trying to do to this woman. They are convicted by their own conscience. They went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And by the way, we're not even sure why they went in that order. But it says something, doesn't it? I like to think of it, Mark talking here, I like to think of it as the oldest ones convicted first by the authority of God. Not to a point of repentance necessarily, some perhaps, but they go. And the younger ones see that and say, well, I can't be here. I certainly can throw a stone. And one by one, they walk out, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And now if I could ask you to focus in on this scene one more time, the temple has been full. The accusers have left. And it says this, Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, socially, if, if the rest of the crowd is left at this point, if it just sent a ripple, you know, at, at least at one point in this, here we are with Jesus, not with a Samaritan woman at the well, but more than likely a Jewish woman caught in adultery, a rabbi and a woman caught in the act of adultery alone in the temple. There's a picture. <clears throat> and he has just dismissed the crowd by his authority and it leaves this one person audience with Jesus. They are gone. Jesus is left alone and the woman standing in the midst in verse 10 says, when Jesus had raised himself up and can I add again? He said what he needed to say to them and then he stooped and now she's standing there so he now raises himself up to eye level as it were and saw no one but the woman just Jesus in the center by the way that's where we always end up no matter what got you into sin or how many people were in the party and in the mix in the alone, you stand. In the end, you stand alone with Jesus. And there she is, standing alone with Jesus. No one else there, and he speaks to her for the first time. First, he speaks to the accusers. Where are they? They're out of here. Then he speaks to the woman, and watch the careful words that are exchanged so beautiful he calls her woman not in a derogatory way quite the opposite she probably did not feel like a woman at that point shamed publicly and by the way even after what we read here when she leaves the temple and days and months and years after that shame's probably going to follow her in that culture Remember Mary's pregnancy? The rumors went on even when Jesus was adult. And there she's alone with her Savior, filled with shame, filled with her sin. And these are the words he says, Woman, where are they? Oh, I love that. Where are those accusers of yours? Where are the ones that were just accusing you? See, that's what Jesus does right now in his resurrected, ascended form. When the enemy of our soul comes and says, you know, that so-and-so, and they were at church, but they also did this. He doesn't even listen. He sends them packing because the price has been paid for you. This woman doesn't know the fullness of that price, but she's staring at or looking or exchanging in a conversation with the one who will pay the price in a few weeks down the line. And he says in the first question, woman, where are those accusers of you? Question number one, the simple answer is they're gone. 
at the spoken word of Jesus, they're gone. But the second question is equally important. They're gone, but why are they gone? And here is the question, has no one condemned you? They came in to trick me, they came in to condemn you. They're all gone, and before they left, did anyone condemn you? Did the judgment happen? Did the rock pile start ascending for them to kill you? Where are those of your accusers specifically did anyone, has no one condemned you? And her three beautiful words both acknowledge the situation, but acknowledge God. Do you see them? No one, Lord. There's no one here. Because of you, no one can condemn me. And it, when, comes, when it comes to this judge that we read those verses about at the beginning of our study this morning, that judge who will judge the world says to believers, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And that is first and best illustrated right here. She says, no one condemned me. You are Lord. No one condemned me, Lord. And Jesus responds to her. Neither do I. That's a nice summary, isn't it? What you going to do about Moses? What you going to do about the law? By the way, if he would say, yeah, go ahead and kill her. Go ahead and start throwing rocks at He would have been in trouble because the Roman law superseded that and he would have been violating them, but didn't go there. Jesus says to her, no one, neither do I condemn you. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You're staring at him. There's no condemnation from this judge because you are set free. I love that when Jesus does that with our sin. And it's available to the whole world if they'll simply say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I know it's very confusing for some out there, but not for believers. From identity issues to legal issues to polit political issues, it's confusing to the world, but it's not confusing to us. We serve the true God. We serve the true judge. And he does not condemn all who will repent of their sins and come into relationship with him but he also loves us so much that he illustrates through the statement to the woman, neither do I condemn you. Now you go from here, but sin no more. Wow. That sin got you in a lot of trouble, didn't it? That was embarrassing. That was shameful. And I know you're feeling it. I know you're going to live with some of the consequences, but here's what you do. You've met the master. I don't condemn you, but you go and let me change your life. Sin no more. It's a beautiful picture. We're, we're actually gonna start when we start after Easter in verse 12, but I, how can you leave this passage without reading verse 12? Then Jesus spoke to them again. So maybe the crowd has returned by this point. And here's this beautiful statement that you know. And he said, I am the light of the world. Hey, the whole temple was very dark with that situation we just studied. And it's almost as he rises up after dealing with this woman, sending the accusers away, and with a proclamation in a dark place, even in a religious setting, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness like we just saw. All you have to do is follow me and you will not walk in darkness, but instead you will have the light of life. That woman just received the light of life. The accusers went out back into darkness. But Jesus says, accusers, where are they? No one condemn you and I don't condemn you. And she is restored into the most intimate walk. We're not introduced to her again. 
She's restored to the most intimate walk, the garden experience that Mary Magdalene had. And anyone who has ever been shamed in a shameful situation for your sin, or if the enemy tries to bring back something from years ago from your sin, and you've taken it to the Lord, there's a couple things you must know before you leave here. Jesus takes care of your accusers, and Jesus takes care of the sin. When you humbly and brokenly, as she was, come to him. He stoops down to your level and he says, no one's condemned you. I don't condemn you. I can even take care of your shame. We need to step into that with boldness. We need to recognize the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus Christ is not only saved our sin and saved us from hell, but he wants an intimate garden walk with us. So that we too can say daily, I walk with him and I talk with him in my prayers. <clears throat> I study his word. I share it with others. And, and the joy that we share, you can't compare. There, there's no man that ever treated this woman like Jesus treated her and elevated her and continue to say, I'll take care of you and all that happened to you because I'm the light of the world. And he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Do you have the light of life today, friends? Celebrate it. Thank him before you leave here today. The shame is gone. Victory is yours. You can walk and talk with Jesus without jumping across the canyon. You can call him daddy. You can say the shame is taken care of. And you can go boldly as this woman did. Oh, there would need to be some healing but it began right there. That's a message I love to share. I focus too much on the confusion of the world and I get depressed. If I focus on the solution for the world, I walk with confidence in the light of the word. Would you pray with me? I want to give you a few moments to make your own application. Your relationship with Jesus is personal. And probably as I've been teaching, something has come up, maybe of your past, maybe something you're struggling with this morning. This same Jesus will stoop down, meet you right where you're at emotionally, right where you're at spiritually, right where you're at physically. And he'll say, can we walk together? Can we talk again? Would you let me remind you by the promises that we're going to study on Wednesday night the promises of God for you as my child release what you need to release and receive what you need to receive from Jesus right now before we close Yeah.